going to be poorly conditioned. So when you try to invert it, it's going to give you an NAN, not a number. That's your program is going to crash, most likely, if you try to invert a very large matrix without conditioning it. Um, and so some folks <coughs> decided to hack this in the 70s. And they decided to introduce what they call a regularizer. And in fact, that's where the term comes from. You are trying to regularize the problem. You're trying to make it nice here, making it more regular. And that's essentially what they did is they just added a small element to the diagonal of the matrix, to each element in the diagonal. That's a simple hack that I think any coder would come up with if they're trying to invert the matrix. What they discovered though was that this hack actually ended up giving better predictions if you knew how to choose the delta. <coughs> and so that led to a lot of statistical analysis, many papers and um, a lot more than I uh, will cover here. It turns out that in another alternative way to come up with this is to instead of thinking of let's hack the solution to get a better behaved solution, it's rather you construct a different cost function and then you prove that the optimum for that cost function is actually to this. So like the question you asked earlier, we start with a cost function, we differentiate it, equate to zero, and then we get these thetas that are better behaved. So the ridge will be a better behaved theta because it has this diagram. It actually gives better predictions, as you will soon see, because it actually subsumes maximum likelihood when delta is equal to zero. So it, it cannot do worse than max, maximum likelihood. provided you have the right delta. And how we prove this, again, j of theta is equal to y minus x theta, transpose y minus x theta. If we take the derivative, it's the derivative of this guy plus delta squared theta transpose theta. And I'm getting bored of doing these guys. Sadly, you can't get bored of doing these guys because you're going to be doing them. But trust me that this is 2x transpose x theta plus 2x transpose y plus 2 delta squared theta. And you can just now group terms and say that this is 2 times x transpose x plus delta squared, because I have delta squared theta, if I multiply anything times the identity, I still have delta squared theta. The identity is the identity operator, so to speak. And I need to do the identity so that the dimension of this is the same as the dimension of this. If this is d by d, this identity has to be of size d by d. Invert x transpose, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let tidy. I'm getting tired here. Okay, plus 2x transpose y. And if you equate to zero, you get essentially what we had before, the estimate. Can I just say Okay, and so if, if we equate to zero, we get the theta ridge is equal to x transpose x plus delta squared i minus one x transpose y. So it's exactly the same as maximum likelihood, except it has that delta squared there. Here's one thing for you guys to practice. What would be the solution if I replace the matrix X by the SVD of X? Okay, so, and when you replace it by the SVD of X, you actually learn that what Ridge does is it gets rid of the small eigenvalues. It has a very nice property, so it gets rid of the Literal details. I'll leave that for the midterm. 
All right. So. Can you repeat the question? So <laughs> I have to move on. <laughs> All right, so what I want to do next is I want to take, this is the objective, okay? So the objective now has two components. It has a component that is what we had from these squares. So it has this blue guy, which is from these squares. And it has this new guy, um, let's call it the green guy, and that's the regularized. Now, what this is saying is that in order to minimize j, my goal is to minimize j, to have as, few, as little cost as possible. To minimize j, I need to minimize both. I need to minimize blue and I need to minimize green. But sometimes minimizing blue will be increasing green and vice versa. So the theta that minimizes blue is not the theta that minimizes green. The theta that minimizes green has to be theta equals zero. Okay, because if you want to make j as small as possible, just choose theta equals zero and you get blue disappears. But if theta is zero, then, then the blue term will be y transpose y, and y transpose y could be a very high value. So there is a trade-off between these two terms. We need to find a theta that minimizes one and minimizes the other. An alternative way to formulate this um, is to say that we want, if, if this helps you guys, think of an arbitrary function. It's an unknown function. We don't need to know it, but you could think of it as one of a delta if it helps. But essentially what we want to trying to do, we're minimizing this likelihood subject to this constraint subject to the theta transpose theta being small, being smaller than some constant that depends on delta, which I've called T of delta. <coughs> okay, so you want to minimize y minus x theta, but you also want to make sure that that product of the two, of theta transpose theta, theta squared is small. Okay, let's look at an example in 2D. In 2D, Theta, the vector in bold, is just theta 1 and theta 2. Okay. If I have the function, I'm going to uh, jr for regularizer. If I have this function, theta transpose theta, and I want to plot, I already know that this function looks like it's a <coughs> looks like this in theta 1 and theta 2 and if I want to find this equation it, uh, the contour plots of constant height so I'm interested if I want the curves the curves at which the height above the ground is the same then I just need to look at the equation delta squared theta transpose theta is equal to a constant. And that just gives me, I can subsume, so I can just write this as theta 1 theta 2 times theta 1 times theta 2 equal to the constant times delta minus 2, which is still, a, you can think of it, the whole thing is still a constant in terms of theta. And so this is just theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared equal some constant. Now that's the equation of a circle. Okay, x squared plus y squared equal radius squared. And so the contours, if you think of the contours as what we observe here at the bottom, they're all circles. The circle center at the origin. Okay, so that, that's the shape of the first component. The other guy is kind of, this other guy here 
will be over here. So this is this guy is JR and I'm gonna call this other guy JL for the likelihood. That other guy will be some Gaussian around so some sorry not Gaussian but some cup around here. <coughs> The minimum of it, because if you differentiate JL and equate to zero, you get the minimum, which happens to be the least squares. So this is the theta least squares. That's the location. And that's the same as the theta maximum likelihood, which has two components. Now, it's also a quadratic because there's a theta 1 and theta 2. But in this case, there's cross terms. So if you expand this guy here, you will get something of the form a times theta 1 squared plus b times theta 2 squared plus c times theta 1 plus d times theta 2 plus e equal to 0. That's the equation of a parabola. Not parabola, uh, it's the word <coughs> ellipse. What if you get plus f times theta 1, theta 2? Oh, yeah, I missed 1. And because I did this, and it had negative, and I plotted it, and it looked like a plane, a bent plane, twisted plane. And when the signs were different, so when theta 1 was positive and theta 2 was negative, or the other way around, it, it went, it went no, down. Trust me that that's a quadratic form. It cannot be negative. I can go over your work later, but it's yeah. not going to be negative. It's going to be, it, we're going to get a, uh, JL is positive. This, yeah, anyways, I can show you. JL is positive, and if, if you expand it just like I did for the circle, you'll get the equation of an ellipse. Uh, I will go over your work, but mark my words, you will get an ellipse. Okay, so this will have some contour plots <coughs> that when I plot the contour plots, they will look like this, something like that. Okay. Now, drawing in 3D is very hard, as you can see. So I'm going to now forget about these cups, and I'm only going to look at the plane. So I'm only going to plot the contour plots next. OK? All right, so we have theta 1, we have theta 2. <coughs> we have this green guy and we know that the contour plots are circles centered at the origin okay. some more circles than others um, and we know that the ellipse uh, the blue term will be ellipses. We don't know what they are, but let's just pick a point arbitrarily. Let's say that they're centered here. All right. Now, we know that the center of the blue guys, this point here, which has these coordinates, theta 1 ml and theta <coughs> 2 ml, this point here is the minimum of JL, right? Because it's, by definition, it's the point that goes down of lowest height. Now, 
we also know that's when delta squared is equal to 0. Okay, because when delta squared is equal to 0, the second term vanishes. We also know that if we let delta squared go to infinity, then the second term will basically have much more importance than the first term. So the first term, y minus x theta times 1 minus x theta, that might be, say, 100. And if delta squared is 10 million, then the only way you're going to minimize j is by making theta very tiny. And so, if delta goes to infinity, if you have a very large delta, and the reason why I squared is because I want to emphasize that I want that weighting. Delta basically balances your desire to have small thetas and your desire to fit the data. And that balance, I just want it to be positive. That's why I always put the square on top. Now, what happens for a different delta that is not zero? And so let's pick a nice color for that. That would be a good color. Yeah. Red again. Okay, let's pick. Uh, no, we already have red. No. Purple. Yeah. purple. Let's go with purple. Purple. We just called our daughter violet. So purple's close. Okay. So I will make the following claim. The optimum will be the point, the optimum for any delta would be the point where the two curves, the ellipses and the circles, are parallel, where the contour plots are parallel. The gradient by definition is perpendicular to the contour plot, so another way to say this is that the gradients are collinear. And that's the starting point for the whole field of convex optimization which I don't attack here, but you, will, you can discover about it in fourth year. In fourth year, this is actually where the optimization course will get started. The simplex algorithm and so on is derived using this intuition. Why is that point a solution? Because let's consider, let's, I'm going to argue it the following way. Let's say that I choose that point. Okay, let's say that I change the likelihood. Um, so I can, actually let's say that I don't want to change the likelihood. So I want to keep, I want to look at another point where the likelihood is the same. All these other points give me the same height JL. So, so the height of all these purple points is the same because they're all in the same contour plot for JL. They all have the same height in terms of JL. However, if I move from this point to this point, or even just to this point here, my blue has increased. Okay? Sorry, my green has increased. So if I move to any other blue point, if I keep the blue fixed, and I move by keeping it fixed, so for the same blue, I always get a bigger green. So for any blue of the same height, the best green I can get is this guy. <coughs> Let's make the argument now with an orange. Let's now assume I want to hold the green fixed and I choose different points. Say the green is not changing, it's all the same height. But every time I deviate from that optimal point, my blue will increase. Okay? So, because, you know, these guys increase outward. So, if I deviate from that point, either the likelihood or the regularizer will increase. So, I should avoid deviations and I should stick to that point. That is true for this point. So oh, actually, let's stick with orange. Yeah, no, let's bring a cyan. We discarded that name. 
it will be true for this point and it will be true for all the points where the curves intersect let's put one more so one more circle would be maybe like this so here again will be this point here so we have this point this point oh I forgot that it was cyan too many colors okay so it's always these points where they're parallel now how many points do we have where these where contours where two things can have the contours there's an infinity number of points okay because there is an infinity number of possible values that delta could take between zero and infinity for each of those values we get a curve that looks like this when we increase delta thetas go to zero each delta gives us a point in that blue line in that cyan curve and each of those is a solution I'm going to interrupt this now briefly to show you because now I think I can describe to you <coughs> L1. With L1 regularization, on the other hand, the regularizer is not circles, but it's those four lines, so which give rise to that diamond shape. So it's always diamonds, many of these diamonds. When I, the point at which these guys will be the point of deviation then oh, hang on, I need to maximize this and then I can make exactly the same argument that if I deviate here I'm increasing the regularizer if I deviate this way I'm increasing the likelihood so the optimal point then is this point the difference here is that because I have now a diamond the intersection will often be one of the axes, one of the corners okay, so if you have a diamond and circle you, it's very, very rarely will the circle be it, it may happen that you will have a likelihood that will be like this that will intersect well, uh, there, but most often with high probability you will touch one of the corners and when you touch the corner one variable is equal to zero and that's why a lot of these variables will be equal to zero so this picture allows you to sort of see intuitively why this is a better regularizer and what happens when the intersection is not at the corner? if it's not one of the corners or that just basically is the, the data is telling you that none of the theta should be zero and that's also good because it might be that you have a thousand genes and it might be true that each of those thousand genes is actually important if that's the case then that's the case but this case doesn't happen often in practice is that what it, it can happen last year I gave a data set a, uh, a medical data set for people to practice as a homework and by chance it actually was the case that <laughs> It didn't hit the corners. So that was a bit of a, that was a lesson. Could you use a regularizer as a different slope? Uh, could you use a regularizer that. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're not hitting at a corner, could you use a regularizer that has a different slope? You could, yeah, you could then try to do a different you games. Use yeah. There's, there's as many regularizers as students in this room out there. This is the most popular. These two that I've shown you, the L2 and L1, are the most popular. Okay, so that's the picture that it, that's kind of illustrating what this is. So then the only question that remains now, and then this is another plot that basically shows you, let's assume that this is, um, for argument's sake, it doesn't matter what this function is, but let's say that it's um, 1 over delta.
then basically as you increase delta, theta goes to zero. And different thetas go to zero at different speed. And that makes sense because if you look at this diagram, you can see that theta two is going to zero much quicker than theta one. Both are going to zero, but some are going fast. Um, and then they don't, unfortunately, they don't go and stay at zero. But with lasso, you actually, so, and this is real data, by the way. This is actually from a medical, from that uh, prostate cancer study. Um, um, they go to zero, but in, in, in this case, this is the optimal. In that study, they also found the optimal delta. It's described in this book, which is on the course website uh, online. And that's, they find that the optimal delta is that delta, in which case only one of the thetas is zero. But with the, with the, ray, with the lasso, many of the thetas are zero with the sparse L1 solution. We were wondering, what is L-cal volume? Is that uh, cardiac volume? Or? This is wondering. Most of them are pretty obvious, but that Oh, I, I don't remember of them. But the example is here. A lot of cancer volume. Yeah. He, in this book, they ex explain every. I have known what they were, but I don't remember exactly what each of them is. Okay. This is also called shrinkage, because you're shrinking the thetas. So the basin is called the shrinkage. Now, ridge is actually what would, you would get. So we've seen that least squares is the solution that you would get if you just do maximum likelihood. But we've known, we now know that there's two ways of learning, maximum likelihood, and then there's the Bayesian way. Maximum likelihood just uses the likelihood. Bayesians use a prior and the likelihood. Okay? And then for Bayesians, it's about normalizing. It's about com integrating. Whereas for the frequentist guys that use only the likelihood, it's all about optimization, finding the best theta. When you do maximum likelihood, you get as a solution least squares. When you do the Bayesian estimate under a suitable prior, you get the ridge. That's basically, but then the Bayesian will also have other properties. How do we do the Bayesian? Um, this is something that I gave you as a homework exercise, even though the solution is posted online. I still wanted you to go over it. It's a tedious thing that I don't want to go over in class. Um, so, but basically what you do is to get the Bayesian, you want the posterior of theta. And so you multiply the prior of theta times the likelihood. So the likelihood is the same as what we had before, but now I'm going to use a Gaussian prior. If I multiply the Gaussian prior times the Gaussian likelihood, and you probably all have seen this by now, there's this completing squares thing, which is very tedious to do, but very important. You would then discover the following thing. The likelihood, the, the posterior is also Gaussian. More importantly, so that's just algebra. I'm not going to go into that. That's kind of tedious. Um, more importantly is that if you choose a particular prior, a prior that has zero mean, so you now want your prior saying, I believe the theta should be zero. So now you can think of it as a prior. My preference is that the thetas be zero. And my preference is that the variance of the thetas be no bigger than tau squared. So you've made that prior. Under that prior, you do all that completing squares, normalizing, trickery, which is the same as what you do for the beta binomial model. And it's the same as what you do every time. Bayesians always prior times likelihood, you group terms, and then the group terms look like a distribution that you know, and then you just read off Wikipedia, the normalization constant, and you're done. That's pretty much it. That's what we call, it has a word, it has a, this, the technical term for this is conjugate analysis, but it's just basically that. Um, when you do this, you get um, that the mean of that posterior is just a ridge estimate. So we recovered the ridge. Where in this case, lambda is just equal to the ratio of sigma squared divided by tau squared. Is, uh, is theta, what's the dimensions of theta? 
Theta is d by 1. It's always d by 1. In regression, it's always d by 1. There's d inputs, d, th d weights, theta. Theta. Should, when we call sigma n, we... Sigma is a scalar. It's not the determinant. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're confusing me. Thanks, here. Can you take the determinant of non-square matrices? Uh, I'm inclined to say no. Which Unless there is some sort of funky definition of determinant out there, like the SVD. So, um, is this sort of saying that bridge regression is sort of equivalent to Bayesian learning under some conditions? This is saying exactly that, indeed, bridge regression is equal to the mean of the posterior, the mean of the Bayesian solution. So if you did Bayes, if you never knew about ridge and maximum likelihood and all of that garbage and all you knew was Bayes, that you have a Gaussian prior and you have a Gaussian likelihood, you would get a good answer. You would get the ridge. However, we have already seen, this is the lecture materials from last week regarding, but we, since then we've learned that there's this other thing called the lasso which is an L1 okay, so regularizer. So, so if we're so just doing ridge regression, right, we are not, and we don't know about Bayesian, we don't know any Bayesian concepts. So, but is, are we still sort of doing Bayesian concepts? Can we say that? No. If you just get the mean, you're not being Bayesian. A Bayesian wants to estimate the full thing, the posterior. For a Bayesian, there's no such thing as one, only theta. The mean is that, but Bayesians are saying there is not one true theta. There's many thetas weighted by probabilities. The theta that has the highest probability is the mean, <coughs> because a Gaussian is symmetric. And that will be important for the following thing. So we know that the posterior mean is given by the ridge. But then there is also an expression for the posterior variance because we have a whole, we have a Gaussian. And so for a Gaussian, we need the mean and the variance in order to describe it. We need those two moments. Now, if you want to do predictions, and here comes the difference between the frequentist and the Bayesian way. For a Bayesian, making a prediction is equivalent to integrating out p of y and theta. So basically, given a new data point, x star, and given all your previous data, x comma y, so n data points, in other words, inputs, output pairs. If you want to make a prediction, you have to integrate out theta over all thetas. So you have p of y comma theta given x um, and given sigma squared and given the data. And d theta. So you need to integrate all these guys. And then you do the factorization. Then the, 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 to go to the next line, the bottom line, I'm just doing conditioning. And the fact that the posterior is not a function of future axis. So I just drop future axis. Okay. So the basic solution is marginalized, basically. Okay, you want to make a prediction, you need to marginalize. So in other words, I want to make a prediction. I have many thetas, an infinite number of thetas, in fact. They all have a weight, which is the, the posterior probability. And so what I do is for each theta, I make a prediction. And I weight that prediction by the posterior height. That's what that integral means. I'm multiplying posterior. Uh, posterior. This is given the date. So it's a Gaussian. So basically, if my posterior, suppose I have. Suppose my posterior only has two values, so in the discrete case, 0, 1, and then this is, say, 0 
2, this is 0 0.8. Then if I want to make a prediction of what the coin will be, I would wait, I would say it's 0 with probability 0.2 and it's 1 with probability 0.8. So I would multiply those two. Because essentially that's what I'm doing. The first term is the likelihood, but I'm waiting each of the predictions. Okay, so let's look at what the weight of frequentists do. <coughs> The frequentists, as we saw the likelihood, you basically say that y hat is just equal to x star transpose theta. Okay, so that's the prediction. And then the variance of that prediction is just sigma squared. Okay, it's just a single prediction. The Bayesians are not saying that. The Bayesians are saying it's going to be many thetas and we're going to sum over all the possible thetas, in this case there's infinite thetas, and each of those terms, which are of this form, will be multiplied, weighted by the posterior. Okay, so, and it's essentially marginalization. We're just writing, and because Bayesian's out of the view that when you make a prediction, that prediction should be independent of the parameters you have. It should be robust. If you made a small mistake in estimating this guy, then your predictions will be bad. Whereas Bayesians, they kind of hedge, and they have many thetas, and they make many predictions. This idea of ensemble learning is very important. The idea of using many predictors, it's what people call ensemble learning, is sort of was crucial in, in about any of the big competitions on data uh, over the last decade. A okay, quick advanced thing that I will just mention. If you marginalize, this is actually equal to a Gaussian over y with mean x star transpose theta and variance sigma squared when the posterior is a delta function it's at ml. The delta function, I don't know if you guys have seen it before, is just a spike. <coughs> it's just one spike at a point. So it's just a bar there. Okay, because if you integrate with respect to the delta function, if you if you have a function here. you multiply that Gaussian times the spike and you're summing over all thetas, it's only when that Gaussian <coughs> is over the spike and the spike is defined to have area one, that's one of the properties of the delta function, or it's also called the Dirac function. So that's the only one that you're gonna pick. So the delta function is just basically sampling at that point. Is that not just, the same? Go ahead. Is that just not the same as taking a Gaussian and having the variance go to zero? That's correct. If you take a Gaussian and the variance goes to zero, you also get a spike. But so basically, it's just saying that maximum likelihood believes that there's only one solution. Um, the Bayesians, on the other hand, they believe that you need to multiply two Gaussians and integrate. Um, multiplying two Gaussians and summing it is three uh, pages of algebra. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I leave that as an exercise for students in 540. If you take 540, you will encounter that. So the sigma in the prediction um, given by maximum likelihood isn't the same sigma um, from before, is it? Um, the green sigma is always yeah. the same thing, the same quantity. So then the deviation of your Oh, the difference, yeah, you just hit on the really important thing here. The very important thing here is indeed what you just said, that the variance here is given by this. The variance here is given by this. That's the, in a way, if you use the, the I mean, the, the mean is also different because the theta maximum likelihood is the least squares, whereas the theta n is the ridge. So Bayesian is a bit better because it's using the ridge, whereas maximum likelihood is using the least squares, which is not as good. Um, it's still left for me to tell you how to get delta squared. 
But what we already know, though, is that the other thing is that the Bayesian is adding an extra term to the variance. What that Vn is proportional to the data, is the inverse over the data. So it's basically an inverse over your data matrix. And so what that does is that the predictions of the mean tend to look the same. But the variance, the confidence intervals of Bayes are different. They have a data dependent term. This Vn depends on the input data, on, on the training data. And because of that, where you have data, the variance is low. Where you don't have data, the variance is high. You should only be confident where you have data. That again is extremely important. If you're going to be betting out there, you want to know when you have a safe bet. And you only have safe bets where you've seen data. So for this 1D case, um, is Vn, I'm just trying to see why it gets, um, how fast it gets bigger. Does it get bigger with okay. x squared or something? Well, it, yeah. Yeah, because it's given this it, Vn is proportional to x transpose x inverse. So you could take two points and you can do by hand a little exercise that will tell you how it shows. But because you're dividing by the inverse of where the data is, it shrinks where the data is and it amplifies away from the data. And that's why one reason why we bother to put priors that's another reason for using regularizers and get prior modeling because um, this is very important. So in, I do a lot of work with user interfaces. I do a lot of work with recommended systems out there. Um, I have a company in Palo Alto that does recommendation and so on with other folks and um, already sold one to CNN, which is now powering CNN, in fact. If you go to CNN website, um, it's a company developed by some folks that took a similar course to this one here a few years ago. And sort of understanding the variance is very important. Um, because if I want to decide where to gather new knowledge, I need to again know this exploration exploitation thing. I want to gather knowledge where my uncertainty is high, but also want to gather knowledge when I know the mean is doing well. <coughs> There's a problem in, also in AI called reinforcement learning, and it, this is sort of the basis to attack that problem. Um, and that's very important in all sorts of things. Like if you want to schedule when to admit a patient or delay a patient, those techniques are used to schedule that kind of, uh, when to let the patient into the hospital to take measurements and when not. You have to rely on techniques like those. So there's a lot of very good work on op operations research with the South Business School and hospitals, Beast Cancer Agency, and so on, um, trying to do that. Last thing, and then I think we need to stop because I'm, we're probably just tired. Um, is I need to tell you how to choose the delta square. Okay, how to choose the delta square. And I, I'm not going to go into the nonlinear section. I'll probably go into it a bit later. But this, this part is important. Now, the technique that I'm going to show you is one of the projectors type, too. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's. Uh... Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> Projectors will be down for uh, another two minutes or so. So if you guys want to take a break, this is it. Oh. Yeah, take, take a break. If you have individual questions, I'll take those now. Thank <laughs> you. 
tonight. Um, how do we do, um, how do we come up with a good delta? So we're going to try a technique called cross-validation. And cross-validation comes in many flavors and shapes. And I'm going to give you the simplest form of cross-validation first. In the simplest form, what you do is the following. You have training data. And this will be pairs x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, up to x and yn. But in addition, you also have test data. Here is the trick. 
you learn with the training data and you never look at the test data because if you look at the test data you're cheating okay you will learn to predict the test data but when you're given the real test you will fail okay so you need to try to you have to it's important to be honest here because otherwise you get the wrong estimate and the test data say it's xn plus 1 y n plus 1 all the way let's say k data points okay, so we break our data into two sets one for training one for test and you can split it in half say okay, so for now let's use the simplest form which is you split that data in half um, once we do that we don't know which is the best delta so we're just going to pick a bunch of values okay. so in my case here I decided to choose 0 0.1 1, 10, 50, 100 I'm sort of picking like a log scale and then I'm adding a few more where I think it might be the right delta of course beforehand I don't know that I don't know what's the range of a good delta all I can do is guess that it might be a few of those values and then if I see that I have one of them is a very good one then I might add a few more values there and redo it so in a sense we are doing optimization we're searching for a good delta here it's possible to automate this procedure as well and in order to automate this procedure the variance of those estimates is essential because essentially we use those variances to decide what's the next best delta to check but anyway, but for now, let's assume that we just pick a bunch of deltas by hand. Um, what we do then, so you choose the delta. Now, for each of the delta values, you will fit the model. So the procedure is choose delta, say delta equal to 2. Then you compute the theta ridge, which is equal to x transpose x plus 2 squared i minus 1 x transpose y. You compute the y train, which is basically the matrix x times theta ridge, the predictions on the training data. Let's say that all this is x comma y and all this data I'm gonna call it x star comma y star. And then, then you compute the predictions on the test data which is equal to x star times theta r and then we compute the errors so the training error is just y minus it's the prediction for all the indices in the train which is i.e. i equal 1 to n and then this is for i equal n plus 1 all the way to n plus k okay. so we compute the error on the training set and the errors, the square errors on the test set using the, the predictions from the training set and predictions from the test the error or what are we doing? oh we're computing the error of each point we summing the errors of each point in the training set and then after we, we, we sum the errors for each point in the test set okay so remember least squares means the sum of squared errors so the each point has a squared error and so we sum all the errors I'm computing two, okay. the two separately I first do it for the training data using the prediction of the training data and then I do it for the test date. 
So I'm, I'm checking how well can I predict the training data and how well can I predict the test data. Okay. Now, let us assume, I, I just came up with these red numbers by the way, I just pulled these off my head. Let's assume that when you do this, when you compute those errors, that the answers that you get are the ones that I'm showing here in red like 100 and 2 and 10 and 11 and so on. So the next question then is based on those red numbers how do we pick delta? There are many ways of doing this. There's really more ways than I'm going to describe but I'm going to describe just two. One is called the pessimistic view or it's called the worst case analysis which is the one that sort of you assume that nature is out to get you. The min-max this is now a decision theory problem. This is the problem that an agent, an individual, or a robot, or a dog, or whatever, um, has to confront in order to decide what to do. So we use the word agent to describe this, this being that is, or machine that's doing a decision. Um, in worst case analysis, you try to minimize the worst that could happen. Okay? So imagine you have two babies and you have a cake and they each want and the cake slice and you want to make sure that they don't cry because one got a bigger piece when you're cutting the cake. So what's the solution to the problem? Hmm? What's that? Or, or you let one, what you do is you let one cut and the other one pick. Yeah. You let one baby cut the cake and then the other baby chooses. Because the one that's cutting the cake knows that you know, my sister will screw me. So I'm going to try to cut it right in the middle. Because <laughs> if I cut a small one and a big one, she's going to take the big one. And so you're minimizing the worst situation. You can't do better than a half. It's impossible to do better than half that cake. So you might just well minimize. Um, this is basically what in science is also called the Nash equilibrium. Okay. When two agents are minimizing the worst that could happen, they're doing something called best response. If all agents, like of all of you, um, do that in solving a problem, we will all converge to a point of equilibrium where you don't want to deviate has to be a half. Any deviation will disbalance us. And that gave Nash a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Okay. In the worst case then, what we do is we pick the max. We look at the worst situation. Let's uh, go back to purple. The worst situation would be say 100, 11, 19, 20, and 1,000. So you worried, think of this as betting in the stock exchanges. I think of the training set as the profits this week and the test set as the <coughs> profits next. Or, or, or how much money you're going to lose this week and then how much money you're going to lose next week. So. You don't want to have something where you only lose a little bit of money. This, imagine there's a recession, so you know you're not going to make money. You're just trying to minimize your losses. Um, you know you're not going to, oh, it's better to not have very little minimization in one day and then the next week completely collapse. It's, you kind of want to balance these two. And in fact, you want to deal with the worst case. And so if you want to deal with the worst case, then the best is to choose delta squared equal to 10. Oh, what am I saying? Sorry. I didn't do it um, this year because I had um, uh, a TA doing this, but actually in previous years I let people vote and often we, most students tend to like, um, what am I, 
Yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> Most students do tend to pick delta equal to 1 or delta equal to 10 and 50. So they do what makes sense. So we choose delta equal to 1 because it has the lowest uh, worst case. An alternative is to compute the average, which in this case would be uh, 51, um, whatever, 21 divided by 2, 10.5. 10, 10, and whatever this is. And then you pick the lowest of the average. And so you could either pick this, or you could pick this, and then you might then decide to do something smart that is both low average and low, out of all the low average, pick the ones that's the least worst case, so you might then pick this one. So you end up picking delta, squared equal to 10. Which one is the right one? That's up to you. That depends how much risk you want to take. What is the min-max? Pardon? What is the min-max? The min-max is delta squared equal to 1. It's the worst, the least of the maxima. The maxes the maxes are 111, 19, 20, and 1,000. And the least of the maxes is 11. So you pick delta squared equal to 1. And that's cross-validation. Now, there are some refinements to this, because people tend to cheat, even when they try not to cheat. And it's because they do this, and they don't like something, and then they decide to change theta, and they look you know, they start looking at the test set. And so to deal with this, what some honest folks then have to do is create a third data set. So you break your data into three sets, and we call them training, test, and validation. And then you can do cross-validation with the test. And you never look at validation. You only look at validation an hour before you have to hand in the report. Because then you will know truly how well you're doing. Because otherwise, you know, you can still play this game and you can learn to do very well on the test set as well. But then on the third day, you do bad poorly again. So every time you look at the data, you, you've already seen something about the data that will help you. So it's always good to have a data set that you never see. There's other games. I'm not going to go into this now. This will be more like the topic um, of when you do the, 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 the assignments, where you can do different things. Like there's this sort of thing that's very common. That's this called k-fold cross-validation. In this case, there's a diagram here showing you five-fold. And that basically tells you the picture. You train on the white ones and you test on the red. And then you cycle through them. And then you take the average of the, the five errors. That's also a good strategy. Um, but let's forget about this five-fold cross-validation for now. The important thing is the analysis of the data. And the analysis is, this is not about math. This is, this, and you don't, I mean, for most of the techniques I teach in this course, I think as practitioners, unless, you go to, unless you're doing research, in which case you do need to know the math if you go on to do research. Um, but if you're just going to be, if you go and work, say, for Aritzia, and all you want to do is take their clothes, whatever, a bunch of variables, and try to predict which clothes will have more of, oh my god, that's so cute. Um, if that's your variable that you're predicting, um, then, um, which is actually quite lucrative, if you can predict which, for which clothes uh, customers will get really excited, then you are in business. Uh, Aritzia employs, I believe, um, lots of workers to just do that kind of analysis. Look at Pinterest and look at many variables and try to predict whether someone's going to buy that cute top or not. Um, and a lot of it could be automated. Uh, I don't know if they do automate it or not, but Certainly, 
Lululemon, and I think is a bit smart about this. The gap is definitely, the, the big companies in the US, they're definitely smart about machine learning. They're definitely trying to maximize the bang for the buck. Um, so, you will be able to use like neural nets and random forests. You can download, there's toolboxes out there. There's like Weka, there's uh, scikits and so on. You don't need to code these things. You just download the software. However, the software has free parameters like delta squared. And so in a sense, this is the most important part of the course because when you download that software, you're going to need to know how to set those parameters and you need to know the meaning of what they do. Um, and so the next, this slide and the next one, I, I feel is the most important for practitioners moving on. Um, and the, here are the things to remember. If you increase the regularizer, delta squared, then your train error gets worse. That makes sense because the total error is two things, train error, the likelihood, and the regularizer. If you're increasing delta, you, the, you're going up, you, you're going down into circles in the middle, but you're actually getting a worse likelihood. So your training error is going up as you increase delta. However, the test error goes down. So there is a sweet spot, and that's what we find by cross-validation. Cross-validation is giving us the sweet spot in which the, the, the worst case in this case is minimized. We, we want to do well not only on training but also on test. It doesn't help to do very well on the training but then the next day you make a bigger error than you would have made if you had afforded a little bit more error in the training. Yes, you want to minimize errors in the future. Minimizing errors in the future is what we call good generalization. You want models that will generalize to new situations, to the future. Another technical term that we use is for the same thing is we don't want models that overfit. Now, here are the important lessons. In this case, I will take a quadratic function Okay, a quadratic x, y. And then in order to generate data from the model, I'm going to generate synthetic data. And then the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to pick a bunch of x's, maybe on a grid. Like, for example, in Python, you'd say, I want x to be 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 1. And then for each x, you evaluate this quadratic here. You choose a particular value. You, you, I don't know, you might say, let's pick theta naught equal 1, theta 1 equal 2, and theta 2 equal 3. So just pick these values randomly or whatever. Those, those are the, just the, the, true, the true thetas for which you're going to generate data. And then what you do is for each of these axes, you plug them into this formula and that gives you this height. Okay, it's precisely the height of the line and this is y hat. Oh, the equation of this line. And then you add noise to it. You add noise to each of the x's. And the noise is just with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So it will be something like, oops. You'll have a point here maybe, a point here, a point here, a point here, and so on. So you basically, you're generating data. Okay, so that's how we generate data. So you use the true model you use a probability to generate data. And then what we're going to, then the exercise I'm going to do is I'm going to see now if I can, and the reason why I'm using a model to generate data is because now I do know the true model. In this case, I do know the truth. 
you know, in your typical situation in life, you just give data, you don't know what the true model is, you need to try to figure out what a good model. But in this case, I know what the true model is. It's the quadratic. That was the model from which I generated data. Now, let's assume that I choose a model now, that is y hat equal theta naught plus x times theta 1 plus x times theta 2. So I choose that model. And, but in this case, I, I forget that I know thetas, and I'm going to try to learn the thetas. So I'm going to assume that all I have is x and y, and I'm going to learn the thetas. But I do have the right model. I have a quadratic, and the true model is a quadratic. So the models agree. So I use, I don't know, ridge or least squares or whatever to, to learn theta. Okay? Once I have learned theta, I look at the, the mean squared errors, again, which is just the average of y minus y hat squared, and then divided by n, the number of data the average error. And this is what I find. And I actually did this with, uh, this is the exercise. Well, I didn't do this, actually. This, was, uh, this is part of something called the PMTK toolbox, um, which if you go to Kevin Murphy's website, um, you can find um, there. Kevin Murphy used to be a professor here. He's now working at Google. And he actually has a very nice book in machine learning. I don't recommend that for this course. I do recommend after the course, because after the course you'll be able to read it. But before, <laughs> but it's a bit advanced. It's definitely the textbook for 540. It's an excellent textbook. OK, so if you do this exercise, and then I fit this model to the data, and I vary the number of data, so I repeat this experiment many times. I repeat the experiment with zero data, 25 data, 50 data, 75 data, 100 data, and so on. Okay, different numbers of data. And I study how does the error vary as a function of the number of data. I learned the following things. First, neither my training error nor my test error go to zero, ever. And they don't go to zero because the quadratic cannot go straight through each point. There's always going to be an error. OK, so we're always, we're always making these small errors. Those, those we can't escape. That is, inherently, the system has noise. And we're going to pay for noise. So there's always this minimum error, which is due to noise. Okay, so that's. That's the first thing. If lesson one, if you download some software and you try in your data and the error is zero, <laughs> you might be doing something not cautious. You need to really think of what's going on. The other thing is the training error might be really low. In this case, well, this is the situation. Your training error is really small for that number of data. But what happens is that you're overfitting the data at that stage. As the data increases, the training error tends to converge more to that expected thing that should be the, the lowest that you can make, which is the black curve. And the test error goes down. In this case, the convergence is very quick. In fact, after just a couple of 25 data points, we've gone to line. This is when the model that you choose has the same complexity as the model that, uh, that we were learning, that generated the data. Let's assume now that I'm going to use a simpler model. So I'm going to use theta naught plus x theta 1. In other words, my data, my data was generated according to a quadratic function. This was the true data. And instead, I'm going to use a prediction that is a line. 
Okay, so you, you can see the problem of trying to fit a quadratic, quadratic data with a line. It's impossible to go through all the points. And so even if you get more points, it's not going to get better. Okay. Now, lesson two. If you keep adding more and more data, if you get more customer data coming in, and results are not improving, time to change the model. Time to try something a bit more complex. Especially because you've, you've been careful, you did cross-validation, you see that your train error and your test error are about the same height, so you know you, you've balanced the two errors, but it's not going down. It's, it's always a high error. You need a better model. And in science, this is where we, um, like search, in terms of building like models of the brain and so on, this is where we are right now. We use very simple, um, we, uh, the current neural networks that we have are very simple, very few parameters. It's only now that there was this big thing of the Google network where they use huge numbers of parameters and we finally are getting to the point at which we're escaping this problem. I would say that right now in terms of building the brain, we're here. Our models are too simple. How do you know the error is high if you don't know the noise, if you don't have this black line? When I built my neural nets, they're not able to see. My models are, in, are incapable of recognizing objects. So you have to use your prediction somehow and do an experiment. Yeah. You're basically, you're trying to achieve a task and the model is not giving you the task. Or maybe, maybe my profits are still too low and I have some reason to believe that I should be able to get a higher profit. In my case, I, believe, I have reason to believe that this computer will one day be able to see as well as I see. And the only reason I, have, I believe that is because, well, all of you are capable of seeing as well I, or better than me, in fact. If the biological evidence exists, then I believe that I haven't achieved my best. So, they will surpass us, but not there yet. Okay, this is when the model is too simple. So sometimes, and think about the brain, we have billions of neurons and typically our models have 10 or 10,000 parameters. Finally, what I might do is I might choose a predictor that is theta naught plus x1, um, x times theta 1 plus x squared times theta 2 plus all the way to x 14 theta 14. And this was Kevin chose that. Kevin or Matt. Matt took this, was a student that took this course and developed the toolbox. Uh, actually, that's not true. Matt took cognitive science with me as a college student. Uh, very bright kid. So, we choose now a very complex model. A polynomial of degree 14 is a very squiggly model. So if you have only a couple data in the quadratic, your polynomial of degree 14 is going to do this. So on the training, which is those three points, the error is zero because the line goes straight through the point. So the training error is zero. You're doing well. On the test, though, you do really badly. As you can see, that red curve is really high. You can do unboundedly poorly by doing this. Okay, so if your model is very complex, you're doing what we, in this case, say overfitting. And so how can we stop the model from overfitting? We can just simply add more data because as the data increases make it this polynomial might go crazy out here but when it comes here where the data is, 
it's constrained by the date. It has it only has so much curvature, and so it can't jump off within the date. So you get a nice fit there, but the the cost of it is that you need a lot more data. When you hear about all this stuff that's going on, on that is very relevant to us, computer scientists, as we embark into the, you know, in this century, there's this whole talk about big data and data and so on. And you hear these companies and blogs going that we just need more data, more data. Um, um, that might be so, but then you need to have a very complex model. And it might be that you need a, a cluster that is a lot bigger than all of Amazon's computing in order to be able to deal with uh, the problem. An alternative to doing this when you have a lot of data is one way to control complexity is just by increasing. An alternative when you have a polynomial of degree 14, this is the same example. Let's assume we're doing rich regression to estimate the theta. In other words, we have basically the rich cost. Nonlinear regression with basis with polynomials is still linear regression. We just need to reinterpret the x's as this guy phi. There's still inputs. We get to observe the x's. So we observe x14 x to the power 13 and so on. And so this is just the same as ridge and we solve for theta. Once we have the matrix phi, this is just again, just linear regression. But when we choose delta without increasing the data, so we just use a few points like I'm showing you these points that we have here. We can choose delta to balance the training and the test error. And by choosing delta, this knob, you can either get if you have a too tiny delta, you overfit. Your training error is small because the curve is almost going through all the points in the training. These blue points are all training data. So you're overfitting. If your delta is too large, you know, you're just forcing. What you're doing is, by making delta large, you're saying, I want many of these thetas to go to zero. And so what that going to do is going to get rid of these, some of these thetas. And so you're going back to a polynomial of low degree. So when you choose delta, you basically are choosing the degree of the polynomial automatically. Okay. And then there's two ways to do this. Either you choose delta, or you just do cross-validation with a polynomial of degree one, a polynomial of degree two, and three, and four, and so on. But a better way is to just choose delta, because it's also applicable in other settings. So a regularizer can give you the right generalization balance. Increasing the data is always a good thing, but it's not the only way to do it. If you're smart about how you do regularization, um, you can get very good performance with few data points. And sometimes you don't have a lot of data. If I'm doing clinical studies, um, you know, I don't have much data about patients. So for healthcare, which is one of the fastest, what I think is going to be one of the greatest applications of machine learning over the next decades, um, you won't have that much data for some applications. For that application, we're going to have a lot of data because as soon as medical records get digitized and we have access to everyone's medical records, there's going to be lots of data out there for good and evil applications. Um, with this, like, with the, this cost function, we're, we're, it seems like we're uh, penalizing all the weights the same. Like, I noticed you crossed out. Maybe it's yeah, yeah. No we're, we're pen there's no reason why but. one should go to zero. That's correct. You're right. It would depend on the data. Yeah. What, what you can do is you can be a bit smart, and you can use a different delta for each degree of the polynomial. So you can use higher deltas for higher order terms and smaller deltas. If you believe that that's the right prior. Typically you just choose the same delta and tune it. And as you can see in this example, it works pretty well. 
when will the slides be uploaded? The slide for the last couple of lectures and all of the website. So all the slides are uploaded except for I mean I'm I'm rewriting this, but this is already this is I wrote this last week and but I gave it to Matt. Those are uploaded. Oh I need to upload that tonight. Yeah. Oh, you do it tonight. So there's only one lecture that I haven't uploaded and that was today, so I need to get back to my office. I think the last lecture was not today. So the last lecture was sort of today's, so it's because I didn't finish it. Oh, okay. It's not on the uh, when is so the sparse regression is the only thing I haven't uploaded. Give me a chance to get back to my office. Yeah, so when is the midterm up to? Because you reviewed a lot of stuff we've just done recently. I reviewed everything from last week. The midterm is up to um, everything up to what I taught today, earlier today. Okay. And there's a reason, because if you study for